that, but I will be adding a little bit more uh, talking about RMIT University and uh, some of the uh, specific research we do at RMIT University. Uh, and I'll also show you some of the additive manufacturing facilities, infrastructures, and a few other medical application devices that we um, manufacture using 3D uh, printing system or additive manufacturing system. So uh, let's go to a start. Uh, although some of you might have questions, uh, what is RMIT uh, stands for? RMIT is the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Um, this uh, institution is very old. When it became university in 1989, uh, their RMIT abbreviation is so popular and brand name, they did not want to change it. So they, with the RMIT, they call RMIT University. And that is officially known in Australia. So let's go to talk about a uh, little bit about RMIT University. Uh, it is a fairly old institution in Australia. It was established in 1887, nearly 134 years ago. But it was established in the heart, exactly in the center of the city of Melbourne, next to GP, uh, GPO. And it was established as a working man college. So the people, those who are working during the daytime, at night, night time they can come, study, and they, and they upgrade their qualification. That was the purpose when it was initially built in 1887. Today, it is one of the largest universities in Australia, and in fact, maybe the largest. Um, it has three campuses in, within the city of Melbourne, and also it has campuses in Vietnam. Uh, in Vietnam, two campuses, one is Ho Chi Minh City, the southern part of Vietnam, another one is Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, in the northern part of Vietnam. In addition to that, it also has uh, networks and partnership through which it offers uh, its bachelor degree or master's degree program, uh, master degree by coursework, not by research, uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, China, and Malaysia, and uh, also Taiwan. At the moment, we have total 86,000 students, and it is a public university, it means government university. And include, out of that 86,000 students, nearly 20,000 students are international students. And among them, uh, 13,000 students also study, uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, 20,000 students in only Melbourne, and 13,000 students are studying with the uh, partner institutions in Singapore, Hong Kong, and China, 7,000 students in Vietnam. And we have 4,500, nearly uh, 4,500 uh, staff members, including 55% academic staff. So that is a little bit of indication about RMIT. And it is, uh, I'm not sure whether you can see uh, my pointer. It is in this little uh, state, is a, uh, it's called the state of Victoria. So although the state of Victoria, its capital is Melbourne, um, it is a very small state within the our uh, Australian continent, but its uh, density per kilometer is the highest in Australia. So a small state, but we have a population almost the same as New South Wales, which capital is Sydney. So a student representative, almost all country, we have a representative from, as you can see, some of the red dot is showing different countries. Uh, students from those countries are studying at RMIT University. Yeah. Okay. So, as you can see, almost every country, of course, uh, a majority of students are coming from Asian part, led by, led by China, and then India, and other South Asian countries. RMIT University, it is a dual sector university. It also has a small uh, polytechnic uh, systems. It is our government requirement it, it, when it was initially established. Uh, so that's why it has, but uh, still, when it became university in 1991, still it continues. But it is a, we found uh, it is a very good system. Um, so therefore, students those who are doing extremely well in the polytechnic system, they can they can move to higher education later on in the university six, uh, section. But the student numbers are very small there. It's not a very very big number. Uh, RMIT has three uh, colleges, and each uh, the College of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Medicine, the one, and College of Business and Law. And College of Design and Social Politics. Uh, College of Science, Technology, Engineering, Medicine. It is a mega mega college. It has five schools, including 
the mega schools, School of Engineering, which previously was three schools, School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, where I belong to, and then School of Civil, Environmental and Chemical Engineering, and also School of Computer uh, Engineering and, um, and, uh, and Electric Engineering. I, college, it has five schools, and College of Business and Law, it has five schools, and College of Design and Social Context, it has eight schools. So total 18 uh, colleges. And each college has a lot of, uh, as you say, schools. And under the schools, we have a department. We have a uh, department or we call disciplines. So now I'll be talking a little bit about RMIT campus. You can see, as I said to you, in Melbourne City, we have a three campuses. Uh, this is the uh, old building, as you can see, on both sides of the road. This is the Melbourne uh, City Centre tram, you can see. And on the other side, this beautiful, nice open plan building, um, it was built around seven or eight years ago. Uh, it is uh, one of the important landscape in the city center. Um, and then we have around three or four kilometers away from the city, main center, city center, city campus, is our Brunswick campus. Um, in fact, people can even work if they have a time, but it is well connected with the tram and other public transport. And then around 20 kilometers from city center, is still within the met Melbourne metropolitan area, we have two camp, uh, we have campuses we call Bandura campus, but Bandura, Bandura campus itself is a two campus. One is the Bandura West campus. You can see this nice building, and this building is uh, this uh, campus is very well known for biotechnology, nursing, and other uh, education and research. And in fact, uh, some of our biotechnology department they have collaboration with Indian pharmaceutical industry, um, and very often they fly to Hyderabad and other cities of India, and then. You can see the little section here. This is the called Bandura East Campus, where I am. My office is located. Yeah, uh, because our some of the academics are located in the city center, some are here. So it is very close to my house. So I am very fortunate in that. But I'll show you next slide. Uh, this particular one, which is at night vision, and how it looks like during the daytime. So, and now I am coming to more specifically. The former School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, or another word now you can say, uh, a part of the larger School of Engineering. And out of this uh, former School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, we had a four disciplines. The mechanical Engineering, Automotive Engineering, Aerospace Engineering, and Advanced Manufacturing Engineering. And out of that, as you can see some of the facilities, and this is the building, is Bandura East Campus. Uh, and the previous slide you saw, a small section of Bandura East Campus at night view. It is actually here. But during the daytime, you can see it is very big, very natural, and uh, and very often you will see in front of it. In fact, when you are coming out of the building, um, there is a the possibility you will meet with the wild kangaroo. Wild kangaroo sitting there. As soon as you are not bothering the kangaroo, kangaroo would not bother you. So, but you need to uh, very uh, carefully when you come out, particularly in the in the afternoon or late afternoon and early morning, and also at night occasionally. And I saw many times in my life uh, that I met Kangaroo here. And then there are some uh, facilities. It's called Industrial Wind Tunnel. Uh, this is one of my uh, former uh, uh, classmate friends. Uh, he is sitting here, and inside the tunnel is a car. And you can see there is another car. If you look at inside that, there, I'll show you a little bit there. And this is our. It's the second largest uh, wind tunnel in Australia, and it requires almost one megawatt power to run the tunnel. Uh, and this is the fan. And you can see a little black, uh, you know, dressed man. Uh, it was, in fact, is me uh, in 1998, long time ago when I was a young man. And then there are other facilities, renewable energy, um, the material testing, the engine dynamometer, uh, the car dynamometer, the extrusion molding, everything. Almost, it's, I just show you a few things, but then we have a lot of other things. And our school, former School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering, we had around 140 staff, uh, both in Bandura and city campuses. And our annual budget of the school is, uh, is around $60 million. But our university operational budget is $1.6 million. So uh, we have a good publication track record from our school, from a former school, School of Aerospace, Mechanical and Manufacturing. On average, around 260 research papers annually we produced. And uh, we also produce bachelor engineering, as you see, all the discipline offer bachelor, masters by coursework and research, as well as PhD by uh, research, that is by thesis. So these are the little bit of overview. But now I want to show you 
more detail what are the things we do under the each of these discipline uh, in in our former school of aerospace mechanical and manufacturing engineering so you can see we have a big research group on industrial aerodynamics we have another research group is automobile research uh, renewable energy sports aerodynamics aerospace research and under this we have a lot of work we do uh, you see the road vehicles building and structure terrain aerodynamics character aerodynamics this is my specialization because i did my phd in road vehicle aerodynamics so this is my heart is lying in this area in addition to that i'm also involved in crash openness i did a lot of uh, work when i was doing my phd and thereafter as well although it was not directly my phd work. Uh, renewable energy yes i'm also involved with that particularly wind engineering um and also and also uh, photovoltaic cell uh, in addition to that there is a one speciality you can see sports aerodynamics many of you in uh, india bangladesh or some other country very often you say what is to do with aerodynamics in sports but there is a huge i'll show you a couple of slides um, now and uh, this aerodynamics of sports nowadays all sports are competitive and therefore uh, it aerodynamics any sports which experience speed more than 30 km or 20 km per hour aerodynamics can play an important role as a result as a result uh, we need to look at we need to look at in competitive uh, sports so you can see here we do spherical ball aerodynamic research virtually every projectile is spherical and then oval shaped ball that is rugby australian rules football american rules football and then helmet thermal comfort bicycle aerodynamics bicycle itself by, and the rider as well ski jumping alpine ski aerodynamics textile aerodynamics that is a new terminology many people even don't believe what is it and human body biomechanics all these things and this area i also specialized in fact uh, when i finished my phd i virtually um, along with uh, two of my colleagues we built this area for rmit and rmit is well known uh, for sports um, engineering uh, particularly with sports aerodynamics uh, because of this area and then we have also aerospace engineering they do a lot of work air safety aerodynamics aircraft maintenance flight test space research composite and nanomaterials airborne and under underwater autonomous systems which is particularly important for detection as well as for submarines so if you look at now more on sports aerodynamics as you see it is my little bit of hobby that's why i'm focusing although our uh, topic is today uh, Energy manufacturing application in medical uh, devices. We'll come in a second about that, but I also show you these things. I took this opportunity to tell you a little bit more. So you can see here is the example. And average speed is 95 km per hour. You cannot avoid aerodynamics. Significant influence of aerodynamics and on, on the body position, the suit, this dress or the, or the body um, suit, it is not a simple suit. It is highly engineered suit with particular emphasis on aerodynamics. So I don't have enough time. Otherwise, I would actually tell about this project, uh, these sort of things for a long, long time. And then you can see downhill ski can easily can go up to 120, 130 km per hour. And then sprint, Everest, Everest is 32 km, but some bus can go up to 40 km per hour. And then the speed is skating. Is the average speed is a 50 kilometer in some sense it can go even 60 70 kilometer per hour and if you look at here this particular group it is a canadian team in 2010 they got a gold medal in vancouver winter olympic and if you look at their their outfit this outfit is not a is not a normal outfit uh, bought the material from the shelf and the and they built it no huge research if you look at very carefully you can see the every section of the body has a different type of materials and these different type of materials the orientation of the fiber plays a significant role the bicycle aerodynamics cycling racing very important in australia is a very popular today france you know every year uh, it is an important event and you can see how these people are trying their best swimming swimming also another important thing australia is very good on swimming as well we get a lot of gold medals every year um, of course, we are very competitive with the rest of the world. And uh, around 7.2 km per hour speed in water is used. You have to overcome uh, 1,000 kg per um, kilo, kilo, kilogram per meter cube density from considered to 1.2 kg per meters uh, per, per meter cube uh, density of the air. 
so 800 times more so therefore it cannot go very fast and it is a two meter per second in water so they also have an outfit which i'll show you next slide um, and you can see here this person is trying very hard and this person is going out by the ski very fast their oval shaped ball and particularly i draw you with the swimming dress swimming outfit here this was uh, before 2010 Beijing Olympics, and after that they banned it because a lot of people got, got uh, their world record. Twenty world record was happened on in swimming events, which is un, which is uh, usually unusual. And therefore they thought, uh, with the speedo, the company manufactured these suits. They said that with these suits they achieve all this uh, high performance thing. And then the swimming uh, regulatory authority FINA they banned swimming dress, full dress, full body dress. So for the men, only half. But the women still can use the full body and here is the tricks and i do not have enough time otherwise i could actually explain these things what is going on here and we did uh, a lot of work in fact uh, two phd students did on swimming under me and completed on this so uh, as you can see it's a huge huge area in this um and then this is our industry a little bit more uh, bigger way this is our closed return circuit wind tunnel remember i i showed you uh, that um, wind tunnel that, that this is our test section where the car was and this is the fan where i was standing here in 1998 when i was doing my phd and this is the test we usually do with the helmet aerodynamics because when we do the helmet aerodynamics testing at that time we want to have a representative body of a, uh, of, a, of, a of a human being otherwise it will be irrelevant when we optimize the helmet so uh, if you look at and this is a real man it is not a dummy in the wind tunnel and one of my students very professional students and he wanted um, also he has a great interest look at here how complex the air flow around the body he injected smoke it comes here how it goes and then we can see there is a little bit of flow separation in this area particularly students or the academic those who are uh, familiar with fluid mechanics you know as soon as you have a separation here you create an extra drag extra, extra aerodynamic resistance which you don't want to have it because you want to overcome that and then your biological energy will be used so and you can see where we injected on the time trial helmet racing racing time trial helmet and you can see still there is a flow separation here so therefore we now will be looking at more closely how we can make the flow more streamlined around the body instead of separation so this is how we determine and optimize all this um, position helmet body in the wind tunnel before actually our athletes from australia when they go for competition so it is not we believe only god uh, we believe in in uh, science and technology we also believe we also believe in um, perseverance individual things and also of course all the uh, divine power so in science technology uh, perseverance natural talent you need to combine together otherwise you will not be competitive yes you will be maybe one of the top 10 but not one of the uh, top three and if you are not one of the top three Unfortunately, you will not get any medal. So this is another uh, racing road racing helmet. Um, I don't want to talk anymore because you already know what is the things I wanted to say here. Um, and here, another of my postdoctoral research fellow, he is a genuine real man, which is not a dummy in the wind tunnel. And you can see with the with the skin suit, that suit is the aerodynamic suit, and we are still looking at with the ultra thing because uh, he's a uh, it is difficult for him uh, to at high speed to put a smoke because it disappears quickly that's why we put the wool top and we see the flow separation in this area where we need to look at and the different uh, different three uh the position of the cyclist in the competition cycle so these are the few things i wanted to give you a little bit of indicator that there are a lot of areas still left to do research and of course advance the science and technology um and and the and the, and the advance uh, the performance and the expression. So, uh, if you look uh, next slide, now that is little bit of extra things I told, and I'm coming to now a uh, little bit of uh, editing manufacturing uh, or today's topic. So, all of you know already by this time because there is I saw that some uh, presentation was before uh, yesterday, before yesterday. So, I don't want to um, take you a lot of your time, but I want to say. That additive manufacturing, it is a computer control process that creates three-dimensional objects by depositing materials. It means injecting, in, like inject printer. 
user in layers or layer by layer. It is an industrial name, is a 3D printing. It allows manufacture complex shape that is um, with the precise geometry shapes, which is a little bit harder to make with the conventional uh, manufacturing process. So this is why, as you see, complex shape, and therefore you can, as you can do layer by layer, you can do customization for individual fit, individual need, and so on. But in that mass produced thing, it is extremely hard uh, to make everyone to fit the same thing. So um, one of the important complex structure is there. You can see lightweight structures, the lattice type structures, and it has a significant advantage. You can see high specific strength and stiffness, lightweight design. As a result, very important to apply in the aerospace application. Now remember in this passenger aircraft, as lighter airplane you can make, you can take more, uh, more cargo. And every cargo is a uh, money. Particularly in passenger aircraft, uh, usually per kilogram, per kilogram cost is one person of the first class ticket. And that's why you, you people, whenever you fly, you pay a lot of money if you have overweight. So because that's how they make money. And they definitely, if the structure is little bit one kilogram less, they can carry one kilogram more cargo and more money and more survival. Again, uh, energy absorption, another aspect, and also heat transfer control. That is one of the important aspects in retail manufacturing. So, so what are the editing manufacturing process? Uh, we, there is a lot of process, but I put a couple of the popular process uh, of the manufacturing. That is a binder jetting, and then powder bed uh, fusion, and then sheet lamination, material extrusion, uh, bed polymerization, direct energy deposition. So depending on which uh, manufacturing process you use, and, and, and also material, you, the equipment, the printer itself also need to be in that regard. You cannot have one uh, using buying one do the other things. It's a little bit harder. And one of the example is here, this uh, powder bed infusion system. So what you know the normal process is, first of all, you do a 3D CAD model. And after that, this CAD model, you make a slice, multiple layer. And this layering is here. And then you, through the printer, you give a command. And with, of course, the material, what are the things you want to use, uh, which uh, technology you want to use, we'll be talking about that things in a second. Uh, so layer by layer you make, a uh, deposition you make, and then final product is coming here, is a finished product. So this is a simplistic way to explain. Of course, when you uh, go through this uh, 3D additive manufacturing process, it is not as simple as I'm saying, but uh, this is the basic thing uh, so that I understand the big picture. And now, uh, what are the uh, technology we use? There are uh, a lot of technology, but three main popular uh, technology is used in uh, energy manufacturing. One is called uh, sintering, uh, which in fact, it did not actually liquefy the material. It heats, but doesn't liquefy. So that is the main, main thing in it. And the second technology is a fully melting the material technology. So therefore, uh, it is the second one, uh, depending on which things you are doing, the process I also explained it a little bit here. So these slides um, uh, will be available to uh, to you, and then also it is recording. So of course you can get all these things from here. Those who want to know a little bit more. And the third technology is the stereo stereo lithography, and stereo lithography is mainly used the ultraviolet laser add into this uh, bed of polymers resin to create torque resistant ceramic parts are uh, able to endure extreme temperature. That is another important thing. And these are the three main technologies. So again, um, to make a, a shorter, is the sintering. When um, materials are not liquefied, it heat. And the other one is a fully melting materials. Material is liquefied. And other one, of course, with the laser uh, things, you have extreme heat is involved. So the material is not burning and so on. Now the question is, who, is, who made this, uh, this greater invention? It is a Japanese scientist. His name is uh, Hideo Kodama. He's from Nagoya Municipal Industrial Research Institute, Japan. And he invented the first time in a laboratory environment, the 3D printing in 1981. Uh, the year exactly which year I finished my 
SEC um, uh, in Bangladesh. And so in my lifetime. And then only three years later, another scientist, great scientist from uh, USL, his name is Charles Hall, he actually made the real commercial 3D printing uh, process. And it is it is the third category of technology, which is a stereo, stereo uh, lithography technology used, which is uh, using the laser system. So in this picture, looks like it is a little bit of, uh, you know, very uh, funny thing. But uh, if you look at here, starting from 1981 to 1999, 3D printing was uh, really a, a fun. People used to not most, most of the people used to say oh, it is a big big fun. Nothing can seriously be done. So they never took it very seriously. And very simple objects sometimes they manufacture and usually show in the university or educational or some commercial company show at the display. And uh, then from 1999 to 2010, it started something seriously. And that is the 2010 our RMIT editing uh, manufacturing was born. I'll show you. Uh, a little bit later after one or two slides and then of course uh, now from 2010 and onward is really a new science new area emerging area and there is a future is there and i'll show you how this future is coming up next is who are the largest commercial 3d printer manufacturers in the world Interesting thing is, in this area, most of the 3D printer manufacturers are coming from USA. They, they are the leader. Uh, some of the companies I have listed here, those who are very popular, is the one is the carbon uh, selling, and then Form Labs, Fusion 3, Maker Boot, Print Boot, and then Aleph Objects and Aero. These are the there, but there are at least another maybe 20 of them uh, in this area. Some are a little bit big, some are a little bit small. And then, as you know, Germany is the is the land of precision engineering or any engineering, true engineering is in uh, Germany. And they are also not very behind. They have three companies, very well known. One is uh, Ambition Tech, another one SL Solutions, another one is a Boxer Bench. These are very well known. There are also a couple of smaller companies. In addition to that, our neighbors, our neighbors, it means or Indian subcontinent neighbors, Indian neighbors, that is China. They also has uh, at least four companies, but two companies I have written here is a reality. It is located, I think, in Shenzhen and also Vite. Uh, these two companies, only the difference from the American and German company is that they are also manufacturing not only the commercial one, but also educational one. And even some uh, smaller printer, 3D printer, you can buy in Australia, 200, 300 dollars. So I, I have one of my uh, PhD, uh, former PhD student. He actually has two of them in his home. And uh, he is showing demonstration to, uh, to our students and uh, doing a video uh, from there. And then Korea based also company is called Sindo. Uh, and Czech Republic also has a one company called Kushia Research. In addition to that, there are a couple of other countries also have. Uh, for example, Denmark has uh, one or two company, um, Poland has one or two company, and also Belgium and Netherlands and also Hungary. These are the countries they also have uh, companies. Um, so, but I believe that in the future, as this industry is moving very fast, there will be a lot of other uh, other country will be also coming forward, uh, other manufacturing company from other countries. And I will not be surprised to see very soon also from our India as well. Now we are coming to LED manufacturing for medical applications. The medical application, uh, it is becoming very quickly a big business. As you can see, today in 2020, uh, 21, at the end of 2020, actually, 21 just started. The business is almost $20 billion. And 22, if the COVID was not there, expectation was $26 billion. So most probably it will not reach $26 billion, but at least $23, $24 billion definitely will reach. And look at here, $6 billion was only in 2017. Within a short span of time, how additive manufacturing is moving 
and how it become a big dollar business. You can see it from that little one sentence. And one of the biggest application of um, in addition to that commercial one, particularly aerospace, automotive, and other com other um, and underwater and above water, you have in medical side is the biggest is the dentistry, because as you know, uh, the people need various uh, parts of the uh, uh, teeth that is uh, bridges, crowns, brushes, dentures that need a lot of customization, individual things, which is a mass produced thing you cannot feed the world. So therefore, additive manufacturing has this huge advantage compared to conventional manufacturing. As a result, they are getting very popular. Even in Australia, I heard that you go to the dentist, they have a scanner, they scan your normal teeth, hold the, uh, your configuration, and then they send the, that is images to, uh, to the additive manufacturing people, and they make a custom made for you so which is a really really big advantage with the conventional manufacturing you can never achieve that and today even in small dentistry is a 2.5 billion us dollar industry which is a huge and it is very fast growing and then we also have an anatomical models that is uh, another fast growing things particularly for various um, organ of the body or even the full body or parts of the body we can print with this our 3D um, uh, the printer of additive manufacturing process, and that one is used for doctors, um, for uh, students, medical students, as well as researchers in the medical education and uh, and medical treatment uh, to understand our human body much better way and and visualize the our body internal organs and so on. Uh, because um, I did not mention it a little bit in eleven talk. In fact, uh, before I moved to study in uh, former Soviet Union, former Soviet Republic of Latvia in capital of Riga in 1984, uh, in fact, 19, uh, at the end of 1983, and until I left Bangladesh for uh, former Soviet Union, I studied medicine six months. At that time, we used to look for with the money, but it's still difficult to get the human bones. At that time, there was no 3D printing. So some people, some dome used to get from Muslim people when they used to bury it from there, some illegally they used to steal the bones and they used to give us, or Christian people uh, die because they're not, you know, these people are, these people are buried. So therefore, uh, from the decomposed body, they usually get these bones. And we, I used to use. So, and still it was hard to get. First of all, it was illegal and to get also hard. But now 3D printing made our life significantly easy much better because in the bone we cannot see what is actually inside but with the 3d printing when you build this model you can see everything inside transparent on the side so that is the greatest advantage of anatomical models and then uh, the another application is the health monitoring and drug delivery this is also uh, many of you may not be aware of that particularly some students but our academics they are already um, aware because those are involved with in manufacturing because in our health monitoring, particularly internal organ, which is extremely hard, particularly, uh, you know, endoscopy, chronoscopy, extremely hard. And therefore, therefore, now some of the device, uh, they develop with the 3D printing and they put in the human body, it can monitor your whole process up to one month, two months, and after that it can, it can all, already decompose with our food and then, of course, uh, it can uh, mix up with food and, and go with our extrusion. So which was not thinkable or people who it was or another word we can it was unthinkable maybe three, four, five years ago. So this is an application is coming in this area as well. And there are two more applications which I wanted to uh, tell you. That is the general tools. That is general tools as you can see these are the tools um also 3D printing easily manufactures uh, both medical applications and they are using a uh, very widely in most of the countries, particularly in the uh, developing country, uh, developed country. And the, but the biggest, very fast uh, application is coming, uh, prosthetics and orthotics. Uh, you see, that is important because it is, it needs to be perfectly fit and also function properly and also need to look nice. And that is particularly either our internal organ or internally or externally. And externally, some of the things are shown here. You see the, the hand, these uh, this lovely girls from Taiwan, and then a man, his leg, you can see, uh, amputated leg, 
is uh, is there. So you know, uh, it is an important that we have to have a very nice fit and also and also uh, personally, uh, you know, customized. And this is possible easily with this with this ready manufacturing. Uh, normal conventional manufacturing, it is very hard. Yes, you can make it, but you need to customize, which is also a challenge. And there is another thing is uh, orthotics. Orthotics is usually they use, uh, you know, some when you have some external deformation in leg, feet, then you have to put some, some support device from outside so that you wear it for a certain time and then your body is uh, aligned with that. Misalignment become aligned. So that is called outer fit. And I saw many in Australia, some people, those who have a little bit of problem with the feet or misalignment of the feet, they use a special shoe, uh, a special um, the devices like that. And that is also coming, uh, these orthotics things and using it. And it is easily made and be made personally. Um, and also at this moment, I saw the people, those who are not using 3D printing, uh, they are, is very expensive because they need to buy it and then they need to custom, uh, custom fit. And custom fit, it is uh, challenging um, and it is hard because most of the time you need to take out the materials and sometimes add, adding is harder than taking out. So it is a complicated thing. Now, uh, let's go to talk about, uh, I think, only a couple of slides and then I will stop. Uh, by this time, many of you already become tired. Um, so, RMIT Advanced Manufacturing uh, Precinct, it was uh, built in 2010 in building RMIT Building 55, because usually we number them building, and uh, we have a lot of buildings. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the asset-rich university in Australia. So, uh, in my office is at building number 251, so you understand that how many So, now, um, it was set up with the financial assistance of the state of Victoria and RMIT University, one of its kind in Australia. Uh, at that time, it was world-class uh, facilities. I'll show you in a second. This is the building from outside and then inside, because it has a, this building 55, which is called Advanced Manufacturing Precinct, and it has two levels, uh, the ground level and the upper level. So the two levels, we have uh, all these 3D printers, facilities, in, uh, the infrastructures, and also a little bit of classrooms and uh, training centers for industry people, as well as our students, postgraduate students, masters and PhD, and so on. So um, this facility, it is unique and only one, as I said. And it covers both metal and polymer-based core technologies, together with high and CNC machines, 3D scanning, and mechanical testing. It is, in another word, one stop shop for industry. Remember, it is not only for teaching and learning, not only for research, it is more than 60% of these facilities used for industrial research. So, industry people are coming here, and in collaboration with industry, in collaboration with hospital, we do uh, a lot of uh, things. Now, let's go to show you some of the some of the uh, facilities. This is inside that building which I showed you previous slide. And you can see this is the machine, uh, 3D printers, is a laser powder bed infusion, uh, fusion uh, machine. You remember the technology, the four technology, the three technology I mentioned, and the direct directed energy deposition machine, this one, and then industrial polymer printer and subtractive manufacturing. So these are the facility. It is not a somewhere, it is at RMIT, it is in building 55. We have in this and look at here cleanliness how all these things and it is it it, it it is cleanliness not that people are not touching it people are using it uh, almost uh, we, need, we need to book it all the time because some people are doing something that's why we need to do it. and who is running this show it is not me it is professor milan brand this this man brilliant uh, scientist and he actually pioneered many things particularly in um, 3D printing or medical application in Australia. Uh, I believe that he is the pioneer in, in, in particularly in Southern Hemisphere of the world, uh, Southern Hemisphere um, in, in this part of the world. Okay, so uh, he started uh, all these things from 2013, because remember 2010 it was uh, founded, built, and gradually all the equipment and everything was put together. And then we also have uh, two, three other people, 
and this man is a professor martin leary a south african born um, australian and uh, he also um, is a youtube junior colleague of me and uh, then uh, another another professor professor peter chung he is coming from the industry and this company and then recently joined um, and another um, our compatriot from from india he just finished his phd and he joined this group but these are not the four people there are at least 10 or 15 people including including postdoctoral research fellow lecturer senior lecturer and as a professor and so on so why it is so important why this we all of a sudden started uh, in, uh, from in addition to manufacturing side for the automotive applications and uh, and the aerospace application because aerospace application is a really big one we used to develop a lot of things and still we are developing automotive we used to developing a lot of things um even in my some some of my students even wind turbine was uh, printed using the, our 3d printer in um, in um, that amp buildings so uh, it is started from this and you can see some of the history. in australia around 130000 uh, people are diagnosed with uh, with the cancer and many of them many of them many of these people cancer almost 60% is spread to bone 10% requires surgical intervention and it is a dilemma it is a dilemma because when the bone and other uh, surgical thing is need it need a extremely custom custom fit and that's how our uh, agency started with the Royal Melbourne Hospital. They, they teamed up with RMIT, with our, particularly our IT manufacturing research group. So they wanted us something. And you can see some of the pictures here, where the problem, the joint here is a 60% problem is, and here is around 15%, and here is a 10%, and where is the shoulder is around also a uh, similar percentage. So these, from where they started these things, and now we started. Uh, this business, this uh, journey. Current procedures very uh, not very good, not very good. Then this is why the research is better because the use of standard implants uh, is hard. Lack of customization, significant tissue removal just to accommodate the implant, and this result is significant rehabilitation and recovery time of the patient. Stress shielding due to stiffness mismatch uh, results in bone disruption. Or sometimes we also call degradation and subsequent. So these are the current procedures. Current procedures not very good. It is a real. And I wanted to say a little story about this because I have a colleague uh, at RMIT. Uh, he is from Austria, from Vienna. He himself is a surgeon. He is a doctor, and his first degree is a medical. And he worked in the hospital in surgery department. And he used to do a lot of trans uh, transportation transportation of this uh, bone. And what he is to find that some of the this um, bone, artificial bone or artificial uh, parts he is to get from the company, uh, they are very uh, difficult to fit. And many times he, he advised them, but these people are not listening from engineer because most of the people, those are manufacturing, they don't understand the medical need and medical people, what they want, the engineer doesn't understand. So there is a little bit of mismatch of these things. So what happened as a result, he said, okay. In that case, I will also learn engineering. So he did his bachelor's, master's, and PhD. And then he set up his little bit of own uh, 3D printing system. And this gentleman uh, is one of our colleagues now at RMIT, our biomedical engineering. So this man has a uh, his first degree in medical. He, is a, he has an active certificate of uh, practice medicine. And also he is a big uh, and well-known well -known engineer. And uh, he did his. Uh, bachelor's and also master's and PhD. So you understand that amalgamated knowledge from medicine and engineering need to be together. Otherwise, you cannot make the additive manufacturing, uh, sorry, uh, uh, normal uh, uh, conventional manufacturing object to fit individual patients correctly. That is the important thing what I wanted to say. So this is the dream. This is the dream. These people are working on it so that how they can make it. Uh, they want to make this uh, this type of this type of, uh, that uh, this type of um, this fit in the in the uh, uh, transplant. And that is our that is our dream. From our previous slides, what I've seen current process, we want to have these things in the future. And it is not very far away. It is not very far away.
And uh, this is another thing, as you know, um, some of the vertebral lattice implants is very important uh, because some, very often it uh, becomes wear, wear and tear that you need to put some sort of support there. And, um, and particularly these things, we are very proud that RMIT was involved and first in Australia, they, uh, they, they did it and successfully in 2015 and third printed spine implant in, Aust in, Aust uh, in Australia. But first time our Australian locally manufactured things we put, and it is not from industry, it is from RMIT, that little place which I showed you uh, in, in our picture. All right, so all these things good, but what is the response of RMIT, RMIT's, uh, this additive manufacturing to our COVID-19 uh, emergency? As you know, the biggest problem in last year, particularly in early March and onward, there was a potentic um, this this uh, protection equipment, personal protection equipment, PPP, PPE. It was a big problem. Many people did not have a mask. Many people did not have a overall. Many people did not have other things. As you know, our virus can transmit semi-airborne. So therefore, when the people sneeze, they actually create more than 10 to 15,000 small micro and the big uh, water droplet. And this water droplet uh, can you can inhale and you will be infected. Or you touch them, and then that finger touch you in the mouth, nose, and it will be also will be infected. So that's why what RMIT did. RMIT started to build the uh, the face shield, and this face shield is here, as you can see one of this example here, and uh, this some of the schematics. And we started in the very beginning, very beginning, early March. We started a call. You see, they call to action March 20, 2020, March 20, 2020. We had a serious, but before that, we our authority already started. Our university authority, university research management, they already think, okay, we need to do something. Why not we make some uh, the the face shield using our facilities because we have it uh, instead of the art facilities with the world class. So therefore, what we did, you can see that is a, a schematic diagram of all these things, and then how we um, uh, use using our different. Uh, facilities and then we made them this is one of them this is not a purchased one from outside it is made in RMIT's manufacturing prison and then in concentration with with St. Vincent Hospital and then with these two machines we build them we manufacture them and then we connected them or assemble them here this is the things and that gentleman who is wearing this is all in our facilities in all in our facilities, we made a lot of them and distributed to different um, the first or emergency uh, location where they needed. And and one of them is uh, here. We, we manufactured more than 3,000 face shield, and then we distributed more than 50 different hospitals, particularly doctors and nurses, those who are dealing with the COVID-19 patients. And uh, here I put some of the hospitals. Uh, in our uh, throughout Australia and also and also uh, two of them in UK, London and Southampton. So these are the things. It is our. We did not charge anything. RMI did not charge a single cent. And I forgot to tell you the cost. Our manufacturing cost is face shield was two dollar. But two dollar in Australian context, it is not a big. Why? Because a cup of coffee costs more than four dollar in Australia. Any any coffee shop you go, it is a four dollar eighty cents at least or five dollar. So your shield cost only two dollars and it is very well protected as you can see uh, particularly if someone is not using mask and uh, sneeze or, or cough at least the water droplet will directly not come to you and inhale so it is a good thing now i think uh we are coming to the end and um, i wanted to tell you one interesting thing that is this is the picture of a house i um, got it from a cnn news and that is a two Two bedroom, two bedroom, a uh, three bedroom, sorry, three bedroom is a standard house with two baths and a two and a half car a detached garage. It was actually built by 3D printing. By 3D printing. So, can you imagine from a little display thing within a very short span of time, now house is built by 3D printing and it cost is around 300,000 um, uh, US dollars. And same price also in Australia. Any three bedroom house 
uh, it will cost almost similar in conventional manufacturing. Okay, so here, here are we, and I can clearly see that LED manufacturing has a huge future, not only in medical application, medical application definitely, because it is more customized, but in other advanced level uh, application will come very soon. And with that, I want to uh, end uh, my talk, but before that, I express my wholehearted uh, gratitude and thanks uh, to this Hindustan College of Science and Engineering and Technology, giving me the opportunity to share a few things uh, with you. And also my my uh, very close friend, Professor Shunmat Chattopadhyay from Indian Institute of Technology in Hanbad, or another way we also call Indian School of Science. And thank you very much. Thank you for a nice presentation, sir. So the slides are very nice, sir. Uh, any questions, participants? Hello. Any questions? Don't feel shy. If you have any question, you can ask me. If you feel shy, you can send me the questions. I cannot be hide, hidden because you can find Firoz Alam. You put uh, RMIT in Google, you will find me. Hello. Participants, any questions? Then if uh, nobody has a question, then I have a question. Ah. So how, how, I think uh, our garages will be, um, uh, garages will be just the manufacturing warehouse for manufacturing vehicles. So when you think uh, these kind of things will come, within a decade or less than a decade? I, I think it is not very far away at all because, as I said, one of my former PhD student, he already has a 2D, uh, two 3D printers in his home. Okay. And he's already making some small things uh, using that. And he, but I, initially, when I you know, he told me, I didn't believe it. And he said to me uh, that, uh, sir, it was so cheap. I bought around, I think, three or $400 each. But the material cost is a little bit. Uh, high, but the printer itself is not expensive. They, so they therefore, I think metallic, metallic printing, metallic printing. Uh, I do not. I think it's a polymer, not metallic. I, that's my feeling. I'm not sure uh, because I did not ask him in details about that. But when he told me, I was really scratching my head. That oh my God, the 3D printers now become even available for an individual house, almost like a normal printer. So I am thinking uh, within the next 10 years. The printers, as more manufacturers are coming, the printers will be cheaper, and therefore many garages, backyard of the house, will be a 3D manufacturing hub. That is my my prediction. Correct. And and uh, we found that in electrical cars, so that more of electrical engineers than mechanical engineers because of the conversion and now i find it out with 3d printing more of mechanical engineer than civil engineer so mechanical engineers take the take the job of civil engineer while the electrical people are taking the job of mechanical engineer of ic engineer and other that so that may be the genetics of the technological development uh, i think you see nowadays nowadays most engineering is interdisciplinary because previously, previously we mechanical used to do pure mechanical, but now most of the things is automation is coming, electromechanical, therefore electrical amalgamation, am, amalgamated knowledge of electrical engineering, mechanical engineering is vital. So therefore, therefore, even in RMITs or mechanical engineering, they are doing a lot of subjects are electrical engineering, and vice versa, electrical engineering they are doing some fundamental subjects of mechanical engineering. So that's why, Professor Shambhat, you are right, because some of the electrical engineering are coming to do some work in automotive engineering, particularly the electrical vehicle, uh, electric vehicle, because they already have some knowledge in mechanical engineering. It is not that they all of a sudden coming without, without the knowledge, right. because True. they already do in their curriculum. In their curriculum. And another thing is also right, and that uh, all the power plant, everyone thinks right. that in power plant or power station, people think that uh, most of the engineers will be electrical, but it is not true. I personally, I personally checked with many power plants in Australia and Hong Kong and Singapore. 
that I found more than 80 to 85 percent engineers working there are mechanical vehicles. Great, great. And the next thing to be printed is the bridges, bridges That's and true. gutters. Huh? So then yeah. it will be a terrific thing. Like if, like a place like Bangladesh, a lot of rivers, we can print the module thing, you know, so they it are, will be don't great, worry about great. much. <laughs> so you don't have to bring those uh, fabricated gutters from other places. In the That's river right. bank itself, we will, we will print it and then make the bridge. <laughs> Just you know, one, one couple of machines. That's all. Sir, I have right, one right. question. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, uh, in in your uh, in uh, your university, uh, what are the uh, what are the courses you taught uh, for BTEC program uh, related to biomedical engineering? Okay, because we have a separate biomedical engineering program: yes. bachelor's, master's, and PhD. Right. So, so students don't you want suppose, to, yes. suppose it is a course of mechanical engineering school of ah, okay. mechanical ah, that's a good question because in our mechanical engineering student or any other engineering they have minimum three three electives they have okay. to do beyond engineering or close to engineering programs and okay. then we have also engineering specialist uh, 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 electives so at least uh, three or four of them so that's why what they do this subject, they particularly mechanical engineering students, if they want to know some little bit more specialization in biomedical engineering, then they take this subject there. And biomedical engineering, they also take from mechanical engineering some subjects. Even okay, in fact, uh, major and minor is there. No, no, no. Major is, of course, you know, the mechanical, uh, particularly third year and fourth year level, they will be specialized in mechanical and then um, and then biomedical engineering. They will be also third and fourth year will be specializing, particularly fourth year, they are specializing in biomedical engineering. However, okay. in second year, third year level, third year level when students are already more matured, they can think which subject will be a little bit good for them, or they have a little bit of intention or a little bit interest, and then they take that subjects uh, within the university. We have no problem with that. Okay. And for example, I give you a, I am teaching a subject. In that subject, I find many students beyond not only engineering, but other outside of engineering also comes uh, because they think, uh, particularly those who have a little bit of knowledge of physics and mathematics, they come to do that subject as an elective. Okay, interdisciplinary elective. Yes, inter because you need to have it. Yes. There is no other way. There is uh -huh. there are pure engineer, mechanical engineer, pure me uh, civil engineer, pure uh, uh, you know electrical engineer. They will not get a job in the future because all are now uh, interdisciplinary. So you need to have a curriculum. Also, I'm not saying that you have to completely, uh, you know, change it. No, at least allow 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent subject to take interdisciplinary. And this way, this uh, our engineers, when they complete their degree, they will they will be very, very uh, well qualified, uh, and they will not have any problem to tackle any issue uh, in com contemporary engineering. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So you shown that uh, on building sir. Uh, how much uh, day it should be completed so this uh, building or uh, is uh, shown in that uh, your presentation? Uh, in the building, just one ah, second, yes, I go back back to that building. Ah. Okay, so initially it was uh, 30 million dollar they put uh, the Victorian government. Government of Victoria uh, or state government, it is like a, you are, you know, in Tamil Nadu, uh, for example, Tamil Nadu state government, equivalent to Victorian state of Victoria. The government they put 30 million and RMIT also put, I think, 10 million. So, total 40 million initially we put. And thereafter, we every, every, every time we are investing money there and also we also earn money there because some um, with the industrial project, we get a lot of money and then we buy more equipment, more facility, and all these things. So at the moment it is a self-sustained. We don't need to spend a lot of money on that. Okay. So in the last, and, uh, yes, yes, please. So in the last slide you uh, put on a small building. One. Last yes. slide. Ah. Uh, I think I think he is asking about the last time of the making 3D building, 3D printed building. What uh, is the time? Last, last I think one. this is the question. Ah, uh, uh, last. 
So what yes, is it? Because this one is an example uh, I saw uh, in uh, CNN News, the cable news network of America. They put this one in the news. Okay. They think that some one of the company they are now they are now building it. They are now making it, and uh, it is a three bedroom typical uh, single story house, detached house, and um, and uh, also it cost is around three hundred thousand US dollars. Actually, two hundred ninety nine, but it's a three hundred thousand uh, US dollar. How they are making it. So it is uh, how much days it is going to complete this building, sir? Ah, uh, that I do not know. Okay. But at least I know the conventional house how many days. Okay, okay. Because I know in Australia, they need okay. around uh, one and a half months uh, to assemble if everything is available and everything is, um, you know, many uh, companies are. But I believe that this one will not take that long because the whole uh, parts will be uh, will be printed and that we need to assemble in Australia. Okay. Any questions? No. All right. I think I thank you all, uh, thank you. and it was my great pleasure to to be here with you and share my little knowledge I had uh, with you. Thank and you, sir. Thank you again. Thank you. thank you for the session, sir. It is also nice. I hope uh, all the participants are enjoyed and uh, understood the concepts very well. Uh, thank you so much for your sharing your knowledge. We are very grateful to you and uh, took the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for your enlightening speech and uh, enthusiastic participation. Once again, I thank you so much, sir. I thank so much, sir. Also. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank All you. right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye. 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 We are leaving then. Hello, sir. Uh, Hello, organizer. Is there, no? Yes, sir. Sir, tell me, sir. Yes, uh, one query is there. Uh, so, ah. when uh, there will be a, a certain exercise, now you have said that quiz uh, is to be taken out. Uh, so, uh, it is planned on uh, the last day, right? Hello, sir. I can't care. What, sir? Hello. The quiz ah. related to this uh, particular uh, FDP. Ah, last day, sir. Last day. Last, last day. day. Oh, okay. Ah. It is of uh, how many hours? Ah, uh, it is take a uh, uh, two to three, sir. Okay, one hour, okay. One hour, one hour, sir. Last day one, we can. Uh, okay, it's MCQs based, no? Yes, sir. MCQs type, no? Ah, yes, MCQ, MCQ. Multiple okay. choice. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank okay, you. thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Shall we leave? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. No. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.